constitution just like Rome operated according to a constitution. And so this is a special designation for Philippi that not every Macedonian city would have nor other, every city uh, where Roman soldiers had been. But in this case, this city was run in a certain way. And that explains why later on in the text certain things happened in a certain way. So it says that, uh, verse 13, and on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to a riverside where we were supposing that there would be a place of prayer, and we sat down and began speaking to the women who had assembled. Now, usually what Paul did on his missionary journeys, and you read back in the first journey, read uh, later on in this journey, read in other journeys that he took in the book of Acts, the first thing Paul did when he came to a city and was there on the Sabbath, he would look for a synagogue. He would go to a synagogue. That's, that's where he always started. However, not every city had a synagogue. It was required that there be at least 10 Jewish men that were present in a city in order for them to congregate into a synagogue. So the implication here is, we don't know for sure, but the implication here is that there was a small group of Jewish people uh, in Philippi, not enough to actually have a, uh, uh, a synagogue where the Jewish people would worship on Sunday. So they went outside the city to Riverside. I, one of my best favorite friends is Pastor Jim Shaddix at Riverside Baptist Church in Denver. I like that name, Riverside. They met by the Riverside. That's where they met. And they went out by the riverside, and there at Riverside, they found some women who were God-fearers. Now, that meant that they were Gentile. They couldn't be. They weren't Jews. They were Gentiles. But they understood the Jewish teaching about God. The uh, Cornelius. Another example in Scripture of one who was a God-fearer. Peter was sent down to Cornelius to appear to him and tell him the story about Jesus at a later place in the book of Acts. But it was really important that Lydia and others were God-fearers. They knew something about God. But they didn't necessarily know about Jesus. So what happened? And, and we sat down and began speaking to the women who had assembled. And I know what Paul said. <laughs> Everywhere he went, he told people about Jesus. Christ was the Messiah. This is the promised one. The one the Jewish people have been looking for for a long time since David. Since the time of David. David lived at about 1,050 B.C. So for over 1,000 years, the Jewish people had been looking for the coming Messiah. And Paul told people, I found him. His name's Jesus. I've met him. I know him. He spoke to me. He appeared to me on a Damascus road. And that's the kind of story that Paul would tell wherever he was going. He told people how Jesus had changed his life. Now, there was a certain woman, it said in verse 14, named Lydia, in the city of Thyatira. And, and she was a seller of purple fabrics. Now, what we know about Thyatira is that there was a special dye, a purple dye that uh, was made by uh, the people in that particular region of the country. And, and, and they would take fabric and they would dye that fabric. And that's what this is referring to here. She was a worshiper of her God and was listening. And, and, and the Lord did what? What does it say in verse 14? He opened her heart. What does that mean? That means very simply that you and I can't just get saved when we want to. <laughs> God's spirit has to be working in our heart to open our heart to receive the message of Jesus Christ in order to get saved. That's a teaching all throughout God's Word, but especially if you're reading the Gospel of John over and over again, Jesus talks about that. Unless God draws somebody to himself, 
Now, the terminology I use for God drawing somebody, like a, like a fisherman would throw out a net and draw in a catch of fish, is that God's Spirit convicts us of sin. And that's what's taught in the Gospel of John. That's one of the things the Holy Spirit of God does in the life of an unbeliever. He convicts of sin and righteousness and judgment. That's what the Scripture says. And so Paul is applying that principle here in this, in this case. God opened her heart. Aren't you glad God opened your heart? <laughs> there was a day when in your sin you did not realize that He was the Savior, but somehow through the proclamation of God's Word or through the telling of the story by a friend or by sitting in a hotel room reading from God's Word, God opened your heart. Whatever your story is, every story is different. That's okay. But God in some way opened your heart to receive the precious message of Jesus Christ that he had for you. Praise God. Hallelujah. That's exciting for me. Yeah, I was born in a Christian family, but that didn't make me a Christian even though even any more than a bicycle in my garage makes it a car. <laughs> you know, that just doesn't happen that way, does it? No, it doesn't. I was a Christian because God opened my heart to receive the truth of His Word. Yeah, I, I had sat in the Sunday school classes for a long time. I had heard men and women teach the precious good news of Jesus Christ. I'd read God's Word. But somehow, one day when I was a 16-year-old boy in a church building not unlike this, in Riverton, Wyoming, when there was snow, yeah, much unlike this, outside, stacked up beside the building, God spoke to this heart, and he opened it up to receive the truth that I already had here. See, having the facts here doesn't make you a Christian, does it? Having the facts here, that's what makes you a Christian. And he opened my heart and applied that truth to my life. And that day, I became a believer. And Lydia responded, it says, to the things spoken by Paul. And in verse 15, and when she and her household had been baptized, she urged us saying, if, if you've judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. She know, knew they needed a motel. <laughs> they needed a place to stay. They just got there, right? And she's evidently was a person of means and opened up her house for them to come and stay. I noticed it was important, I think, that immediately they were baptized. See, I think that's important. If you've truly been born again, you need to be baptized. My friend, you may be someone here this morning that has prayed to receive Christ as your Savior, but you've never been baptized. You need to be baptized. Baptism is a beautiful picture of the death burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's a testimony. But it's also a testimony of the fact that you and I, who've been, whose lives have been transformed and changed, and Lydia's life had been transformed, have died to the old sinful life and been raised up to walk a new life in Jesus Christ. Yes, it is a beautiful testimony of what God did in our lives. And Lydia and her household, now, our household didn't experience that just because Lydia did. <laughs> they experienced it because it became a reality in their personal lives. You see, I couldn't be baptized. I couldn't be saved for my son. <laughs> as much as I might want to. He's a, he's a believer, so that's great. But when he was five years old, he had not been saved. He came to me and he said, Dad, I, I understand. I, I, I'm a sinner. I don't want to know all about it, but I, I want to be saved. But I couldn't do that for him. It was a personal thing in his life. For Lydia's household, it was a personal thing. Lydia could not have made that decision for those in her house. She made it for herself. That they all were baptized. Now in verse 16, different story. And it happened, and, and did you notice down through there where... Uh, it said we in verse 11. In verse 11, it became we. That's where, that's where Luke joined the team. 
And in telling the story, it was no longer they or he, but we or us, okay? And, and, and so in verse 16, it happened that as we were going to the place of prayer, that is the place beside the, beside the river on a different day, a certain slave girl having a spirit of divination met us who was bringing her masters much profit by fortune-telling. Now, what was she doing? She, this girl could obviously, she was, had uh, some evil spirit and could obviously foretell the future, you know? And that's what she'd been doing. And, and some slave owners, because slavery was popular in that day and time, slave owners had bought her and they said, man, here's a money-making project, you know? Here's a money-making project. They looked at her not as a human being. They looked at her solely as a way to make more money. And so uh, she started uh, following them around. In verse 17, following after Paul and us, she kept crying out saying, These men are bondservants of the Most High God who are proclaiming to you the way of salvation. They're slaves of God. I'm a slave to these men who are making money off of me. But they're slaves of God. They're servants, bond servants of God. And not only that, she got it right. Not just any God. Because see, to the Greeks in that day and time, they, had, they believed in all kinds of gods. I mean, you know, <laughs> small G-O-D-S. All, ki all kinds of gods. And uh, she said the most high God, she got it right. And not only that, she got right what they were saying. They're telling the message of salvation, how mankind can come into a personal living relationship with Jesus Christ and have their life transformed. She got that part right. And she continued doing this for many days, following Paul and, and Silas and Luke and Timothy around. Um, but Paul was greatly annoyed. And he turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out at that very moment. Just like that. Came out. The Spirit came out of her. Paul didn't want the advertising. <laughs> he didn't want the publicity. Not that kind of publicity. That wasn't what he needed. It was like a, a verbal neon sign following him around wherever he went. And, and after a few days, he tired of that. You know? And so... He commanded the spirit of divination to come out of her, and it did. Immediately it came out at the very moment. But when our masters, in verse 19, saw that their hope for profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas, and they drug them into the marketplace before the authorities. And when they had brought them to the chief magistrate, now, there's the Philippi, there's the chief magistrates, just like they would have had in Rome, chief magistrates. They said, these men are throwing our city in confusion, being Jews. <laughs> the implication is there that because of their Jewish practices or their Jewish teaching, they're throwing the whole city into an uproar. Keep in mind, that city was a, a city of Macedonia. It was not a city in Judea. And so they brought Paul and Silas. Didn't say they brought Timothy. Didn't say that uh, uh, they brought Luke. But they brought Paul and Silas before the authorities. And when they had brought them to the chief magistrates, they said, these men are throwing our city into confusion, being Jews. They're proclaiming customs which are not lawful for us to accept or observe being Romans. Why, why is that? Because Rome 